Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here today. I pray that for every single one of us in this room, God, if there's anything that is distracting us from focusing on you, that we will set it aside for the moment and that we will just give it to you, God. That we will focus on you right here, right now. And that even if, just for these next two hours, we will actually give you the attention and the focus and the glory you deserve. But I pray that it will go beyond these two hours, God, but that you will be with us, guiding us, helping us, give you what you deserve every moment of every day. Um, but if it can just be these two hours, God, let it be so. I thank you for the people in this room, God. I thank you for the ones who might be watching online. And I praise you for the ones who normally would be here, but who can't be here for various different reasons. We love you. We praise you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we have been going through an overview of the story of the Bible. We began in Genesis with the creation of the world. And then we saw how eventually there was this flood that came upon the world a while after the fall of man. We saw how God called a man named Abraham to go to a foreign land where he built Abraham's family up into a mighty nation named Israel. Right? We saw Israel freed from bondage. We saw Israel conquer the promised, the promised land, Canaan. We have seen them go through the time period of the judges. And we've seen them go through the first two kings, King Saul and King David. Today, we are going to cover a big old chunk of Israel's history. Uh, and we are going to begin by finishing up our discussion of David very, very briefly, and then seeing how far we can get. Sound good? Yep. All right. Uh, so last week, we really spent the entire time talking about the final judge, whose name was? Samuel. Samuel. Mm -hmm. The first king, whose name was? Saul. Saul. And the second king, whose name was David. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, and if you were flipping through your Bible right now, uh, you would go from First and Second Samuel. You would flip the page, and you would get to First Kings. But very briefly, uh, before we go into First Kings, what I want to do is I want to take a very quick moment to talk about another book in the Bible um, that David is associated with, and that is the book of Psalms. Uh, since we're focusing mainly on the storyline of the Bible, uh, there are some other books in the Bible that I'm just going to address along the way because there isn't a clear storyline to them, but they were written primarily during the time period of these other stories. Right? And so we're, we're mentioning these books, but we're not really focusing on them since we're focusing on the storyline. And uh, David, uh, he is known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. When you go to the book of Psalms, you will notice there are 150 chapters separated into five books. And 72 of those chapters, specifically in the first two books of Psalms, right, books one and two there, uh, 72 of those psalms are attributed to David. Right? And it's very likely that he wrote many more beyond those uh, because there are several psalms that we have that just don't even say who they're written by. Uh, and so if you just look at the language, some of them seem very Davidic. And so it's very possible that David wrote them. Uh, and so uh, one thing I just wanted to highlight here, um, just to kind of kick us off into this next section of Israel's story, uh, is that not only was David a man after God's own heart, and not only was this, he this amazing king, but he was also a worship leader. Right? And he wrote these amazing songs, uh, and some of the songs that he wrote as a nobody shepherd in Backwoods Bethlehem um, are still guiding us in worship today. Right? And we still sing those songs, and so um, maybe that would be an encouragement to you. Um, I don't know, sometimes you feel like you're not really accomplishing much in life, but you know what? David probably didn't feel like he was conquering, co like he wasn't, um, <coughs> he didn't feel like he was accomplishing much whenever he was writing those songs, but uh, I don't know. I think that's cool. We tend to take that for granted a lot of the time yeah. as, as human beings. Yeah. And sometimes and you don't need to have a big impact like that, right? I mean, David wrote these songs that we still read to this day. That's really cool. Um, but David didn't write them for that purpose, right? David didn't write them, oh man, people are going to sing this thousands of years from now. When you read the Psalms, you'll see that this was a guy who was just speaking honestly to God. And he was singing to God. Uh, and so I think that that's really what we need to focus on as Christians, right? It's not really as much about, um, you know, standing in the spotlight and making these big accomplishments and really just showing off how Christian we are. It's learning about how to be faithful throughout life, right? And that's really what set David apart. He was a man after God's own heart far before the crown was on his head, right? And I really think that it was his time period in the shepherd's fields with his harp and with his sheep. That's where he really became a man after God's own heart. Uh, and so the Psalms... 
Um, they're really, if you actually look at the Psalms themselves, they date from the time period of Moses all the way until the time period of the exile, right? So it's really like all of Israel's history in the Old Testament, now, there are Psalms from throughout that entire history. But David uh, receives credit for most of them, so that's why I wanted to address them here. That being said, you flip to 1 Kings or you flip to 2 Chronicles and you read about David's son named Solomon. Uh, at the end of David's story last week, we talked about how David had many, many sons because David had many, many wives. Um, and it turns out that Solomon is going to follow in his father's footsteps in regards to the wives thing. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but uh, one of David's sons, the one who ends up being on the throne, is a guy named Solomon. Right? And uh, Solomon was David's second son with Bathsheba. If you recall, though, uh, what happened to the first son? He died because of David's sin with Bathsheba. Yeah, he died as punishment for David's sin. Right? And so an innocent child died as a result of what David had done. Um, but the second son, uh, his name is Solomon, whose name means peace. Uh, and he had another name, which was known as Jedediah, which means beloved of Yahweh. Right, yeah, Jedediah. Uh, and Solomon is a great king for a while, right? Uh, ultimately, David is going to go down in Israel's history as the best king they ever had. But if we're simply speaking from a material perspective, Solomon was the best king, right? David was a good king because during his time period, um, there, there was physical welfare and spiritual welfare, right? Um, they weren't really at peace during David's time, but that's because David was a conquering king, right? Solomon, he wasn't really reigning during a time of war. He was reigning during a time of peace, right? His name was very fitting, peace, Shlomo, Solomon, right? Um, so he was reigning during a time of peace and prosperity, um, and he sees Israel to the highest of heights that it ever gets, um, really, on this side of heaven, Right? I mean, even to this day, Israel has never excelled as much as it did under the time period of Solomon. Right? And the way that Solomon's story begins uh, is actually with a co-regency with David. Right? As David is getting very old, um, he's getting weak and frail, and he just really can't uh, do much anymore. Uh, and one of his other sons, named Adonijah, uh, he decides that he is going to declare himself king. Uh, in many ways, Adonijah is a discount version of Absalom, right? Remember we talked about how Absalom did the same thing? Well, Absalom was another one of David's sons, and do you remember how Absalom's story ended? He, uh, he got hung from the tree, and yeah. then I think Joab killed him, right? Yeah, so yeah. long story short, Absalom ended up dead. <clears throat> well, Adonijah's story is going to go very similarly, but not immediately, right? So Adonijah decides he's going to declare himself king, and so the prophet Nathan and Bathsheba go and confront David about it. And they say, hey, David, um, Adonijah is declaring himself king, and you said Solomon was going to be king. And so last minute, David throws together a, a super quick um, anointing ceremony, right? A coronation ceremony uh, where he has Solomon ride his own donkey into Jerusalem, uh, very similar to what we're celebrating today, Palm Sunday, mm -hmm. right? Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem. Well, Solomon does the same thing, right? Solomon rides his father's donkey into Jerusalem, therefore declaring himself the son of David, the one who is here to save, Hosanna. And um, the people declare him to be king. Adonijah hears about this, and his coronation ceremony was going on just down the valley. Adonijah freaks out, and he runs into the place uh, where the altar is at, and he holds on to the horn of the altar. And that's because if you did that, it was more likely for somebody to show you mercy. And sure enough, that's what Solomon does. Right? Solomon just tells Adonijah to go home and to make sure he doesn't cause any more trouble. So Solomon's first act as king is to uh, show grace to somebody. Right? Adonijah should be put to death for what he did, but Solomon shows his brother mercy. Whenever you get to 1 Kings chapter 2, David dies. Right? Like I said, David is old. Uh, it seems like he spends these last few months of his life co-reigning with Solomon. So Solomon is king, but David is still technically king. Uh, and shortly before David dies, he does give Solomon some advice. Uh, and he tells him that there's a few people Solomon needs to take care of, uh, both in a good and a bad sense, um, if he wants his reign to be successful. Right? Uh, he needs to take care of Joab in the sense of he needs to have Joab killed. Right? Uh, there's some other people he needs to have killed. And then there's some people he needs to really take care of because they were nice to David. And sure enough, after David dies, Solomon does exactly that. 
Also, David gave Solomon advice basically to be a man, right? To go out, take care of the people, and be faithful to Yahweh. When you get to 1 Kings chapter 3, now we finally have Solomon on his own. You're trying to figure out exactly what's going to set Solomon apart from everybody else. And you want to know, will Solomon live up to the standard set by his father? Well, God shows up to him, and it seems like God has the same question. God shows up to him in a dream, and he says, ask anything of me, and it will be done for you. And Solomon could ask for anything, and if God were to show up to me and ask this, oh man, I can't even begin to think the things I would ask for, right? God, just give me a whole bunch of money so I don't ever have to worry about food ever again, or I can just purchase a house, right? Um, God, give me fame and glory, and I would probably disguise it under the guise of, so that I can, you know, make you popular or something, right? We could ask for plenty of things. But Solomon, he says, God, if there was one thing I wanted, I want a hearing heart, right? Because he says, God, here's the deal. My dad was the people's man, right? He was a man of the people. He grew up as a shepherd. He grew up as a commoner. He knew the heartbeat of the nation, Right? He knew what the people needed, and he knew how to talk with people. He knew how to take care of people. He spent spend his time on the run. He knew how to take care of himself, how to take care of others. He knew all that stuff. But he says, God, I was, rain, I, I was raised up in a palace with a silver spoon. He says, I don't know how to go out or come in. I don't know how to do this stuff. He says, if I need anything, it's not riches. It's not fame. It's not glory. What I need is a hearing heart. A heart that hears the need of the people and knows how to govern them with discernment. He says, God, give me wisdom. And God says, that was an amazing request. He says, you know what? In fact, since you asked for wisdom, not only will I give you wisdom, but I will give you so much more than that. I will make you the wisest man on earth, but I will also make you the richest man on earth. And your fame will be like no one else's. And people will fear you. And people will come from around the world just to hear your wisdom and to see the things that you've accomplished. He says, this is what I will do for you. And so as we go through Solomon's story, that's exactly what we see. We go into 1 Kings chapters 4 and 5, and what do we see? Solomon is excelling. Right? We see Solomon doing all sorts of crazy things. We get to see his wisdom in action. We get to see the sorts of agreements he is developing with the people around him. And if you're looking at this, it seems like everything is going exactly according to plan, right? To where, I mean, like, it looks like the kingdom of God is flourishing, right? You've got this king on the throne who is the son to a man after God's own heart. And according to the Davidic covenant, God is going to treat him like his own son and take care of him, right? And this guy's focused on God. And when you get to 1 Kings chapter 6, Solomon decides to do the very thing that God had said he was going to do. What is Solomon going to do? Build a temple. He's going to build a temple. Right? If you remember, David said he wanted to build a temple for God. But God said, no, your son's going to do that. Well, that's Solomon's job now. Here's the funny thing about David, though. Uh, whenever God told David that he could not build the temple, um, David took that very, very literally. In the sense of, okay, I'm not the one who's allowed to build the temple, but God didn't say I couldn't draw the floor plans and start gathering materials. Uh, and so David did as much as he possibly could without violating God's command. Uh, and so whenever Solomon is finally on the throne, uh, basically building the temple becomes a glorified Ikea project, right? Where basically he has to get the materials together that David has already gotten largely together, and he has to assemble it, Right? But since Solomon's reigning at such a time of prosperity, he's able to bring in even better materials. And he is able to um, get in contact with this guy named Hiram, king of Tyre, uh, who was one of David's friends. And um, this guy ends up sending him some of the finest cedars of Lebanon. And they begin to build this temple. And this thing is amazing, right? You read several chapters of all that Solomon did here. And... Once again, if you're reading through these chapters, you might find it kind of boring, kind of like the chapters that you read about the construction of the tabernacle back in Exodus. But you have to remember once again why the Bible takes the time to detail all this stuff. 
Because if you remember the whole story of the Bible is detailing God's commitment to dwell with man again. Right? And so, if a house is being constructed for God in the presence of man, that's kind of a big deal. And so, where the Bible sometimes will span generations in but a few verses, right here it slows down. And it wants you to picture what Solomon's doing. It tells you exactly what the floor plan of the temple is like. It tells you about the column, the columns in the temple and what the different designs were on the columns. It tells you about the altar. It tells you about what the walls themselves looked like. Right? It gives you all these different details because it is trying to help you picture what God's dwelling place looks like. Right? Here we have callbacks both to the Garden of Eden and to the tabernacle. Um, but in many ways, it's even cooler than both. Because, well, I mean, it's not quite the Garden of Eden, right? But it is taking the Garden of Eden and putting it in the center of a city. And it is taking the tabernacle and it is giving it solid walls. Because now God's not going to be moving around. God is here and he's here to stay. And so once Solomon finishes building his temple, he prays this amazing, spectacular fantastic prayer and it says that God's presence came to dwell in the temple right they carry the ark of the covenant in there uh, and interestingly enough once the ark of the covenant is placed in the temple we never read about it again in the bible people always speculate about where the ark of the covenant went um, there are many churches uh, and many um, synagogues or many, like but like Jews and Christians alike both have claimed that they have the ark of the covenant somewhere but we don't really know where it's at. Um, Indiana Jones has gone searching for it. Uh, and according to those movies, it is in some wooden box, wooden crate, somewhere in you know, <laughs> some random place. Uh, but those are fictional stories, right? We don't know where the Ark of the Covenant's at. Um, but what, what I would interpret about this is that once the temple was built, the Ark of the Covenant ceased to have its purpose anymore, right? Because the Ark of the Covenant's whole purpose was to be basically... Um, it was almost like the traveling carriage of God, right? God dwelt there, and it represented where his presence dwelt. Well, the thing is, that makes sense when you've got a tabernacle, right? Whenever you're taking a tent and building it and taking it down and stuff like that and moving it around. But once God has a firm home and he's got this temple, the Ark of the Covenant isn't really necessary anymore, right? And so it seems like the Jewish people recognize this uh, because later on in the story, which we're going to see later, um, whenever Jerusalem is destroyed and the temple is destroyed, and we read about what the Babylonians took out of the temple, it tells us detail by detail what they took, and the Ark of the Covenant is not mentioned. And so it seems like if the Ark of the Covenant went missing, it was actually somewhere in between um, whenever the temple was built and the destruction of Bab in Babylon. And um, it, it seems like it just wasn't that big of a deal. right? So it seems like we speculate about it more now than the Jewish people did back then. Either that or they hid it and it is in the super secret place and they just didn't mention it in the Bible. I have no idea. Uh, but God's presence comes to dwell in the temple. Uh, and this is a really crucial moment. Because now that God's presence is firmly there, uh, we have the fulfillment of what God promised back in Deuteronomy. Right? He said he was going to pick a place for his name to dwell. And now Jerusalem is that place. And from this moment going forward, Jerusalem... I mean... Technically, Jerusalem, this really started when David conquered the city. But now that God's presence is actually there, Jerusalem is the most important city on the face of the planet. And that has been a true statement all the way even to the present day. Right? Uh, Jerusalem, even though it is but a tiny city in a tiny country, is still on the news every single day of the year. Right? And it all goes back to because that's the place that David chose where God's name would come to dwell. Right? Uh, and so... This is a really big moment, and whenever you actually look at it, when you're reading the text, specifically in 1 Kings chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, the author of 1 Kings seems to be presenting it as a bit of a bait and switch, where he's almost like, like when you read the text, it sounds like all the covenants God has made are being fulfilled, right? To where we have uh, basically like the Abrahamic covenant, right? Land, seed, and blessing, right? Well, the land part... Uh, whenever you read about Solomon's kingdom, you see that Solomon's kingdom has expanded to nearly the boundaries that God prescribed to Abraham in the covenant. Right? So the kingdom, they have the land. We read that the nation has become a nation 
as numerous as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. Well, that's what God promised Abraham. So there's the seed, right? We see that not only is Israel being blessed, but we have Gentiles coming into Israel to worship Yahweh, right? So not only are they being blessed by God, but they're blessing the nations, just like God promised through Abraham, right? When it comes to Moses, right? The Mosaic Covenant. Here we have a king ruling over the people. He is following the law. He is teaching others to follow the law in wisdom and judgment and discernment. It looks like the Mosaic Covenant is being fulfilled. The Davidic Covenant. God promised that he would be a father to David's sons as long as they walked in the ways of Yahweh. Well, there you go. The Davidic Covenant seems to be fulfilled. And then if you go way back to Genesis, right, where God said that there would be the seed to crush the serpent, Solomon seems to be doing a pretty good job. And if you remember back in Genesis, the reason the seed needed to crush the serpent was so that God could come dwell with man again. Well, under Solomon, the presence of God comes to dwell with man. And so whenever you're reading 1 Kings chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, it's hard to fight away the emotions building up inside of you because you realize it sounds like the story of the Bible is coming to its end. Unfortunately, however, that's not how the story is going to end. Because there's more to Solomon's story than meets the eye. And we'll get there in a second. But first, let's talk about some books that Solomon wrote during his life. Um, one of my favorite books of the Bible, if not my favorite book of the Bible, is a book called Song of Solomon. Um, many people believe that Solomon wrote this whenever he was younger. Um, we don't really know when he wrote it. Um, but according to tradition, he is the one who wrote it. Um, it's known as Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. And um, this book, in many ways is a textbook on romance, right? Solomon, being the wisest man on earth, uh, he wrote many books, which we call the books of wisdom. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these books of wisdom just very briefly, uh, and we're going to talk about each of them. And the cool thing about the books of wisdom is that they speak towards something that each of us need in life, right? Like common experiences belonging to all men, uh, and basically what these books do is they teach you to navigate them in a positive manner that is faithful to God, right? And so whenever you look at these books, theology will be mentioned. Uh, and in some of the books, theology will be the main thing being discussed. But they're different than some of the other books in the Bible. In the primary sense of, these books primarily exist to be applied, right? A lot of the other books, they exist to be understood and applied from that understanding. But the books of wisdom... Well, wisdom is applying the knowledge you have, right? That's what wisdom is. And so these books exist to teach you something, right? And so the Song of Solomon is teaching you how to have a healthy relationship, right? Uh, and this is not only romantic relationships. It describes it in the context of a romantic relationship. But in general, it seems to be describing um, just how to relate to fellow humans in a God-honoring manner. The reason why it does it in the context of marriage is because marriage is the most intimate relationship you can possibly have. Uh, and whenever you actually read this story, um, there's a million different ways that people have chosen to interpret it. Um, obviously, I believe my way is the correct way, but I'm always open to other interpretations. Um, but there's a storyline in the Song of Solomon. And as best I can understand, this is the storyline. Um, there's these two people, right? A guy and a girl. When you read the book, it's formatted like a script. Uh, to where the man and the woman are singing back and forth to one another. We don't see how this guy and this girl meet, but we get to meet them very early on in their relationship. And they are madly in love with one another. Uh, it's the closest the Bible ever gets to describing dating, uh, because dating obviously wasn't a thing back then. Uh, and the man, he is a shepherd, right? The woman is a vineyard worker. And in many ways, the woman is like a Cinderella-like figure, right? Where she is growing up in a household uh, where her dad doesn't seem to be in the picture. Either he died or he's just not there. Um, but she lives with her mother and her brothers, and her brothers are kind of cruel, right? And her brothers make her do a lot of the manual labor that women typically would not be required to do, right? And so you feel kind of bad for this girl. But this one solace that this girl has is that there is this shepherd boy that she has fallen madly in love with. And when this man speaks... It soothes all her insecurities, and it just makes her feel at home and comfortable. And as you read through the story, you're learning more about these people, and you learn how to navigate 
the early stages of a relationship, how to navigate through attraction, how to navigate through sexual desire as it is increasing and figuring out how to handle that in a positive manner. And eventually you get to navigate how to handle conflict when it arises. And whenever one person is retreating, how to help them come back to you and how to just navigate these things in a very positive manner. You get to see the couple get engaged. Uh, and then you get to see them navigate through the hardships of prolonged engagement as they're waiting to get married and they're longing to get married, but it's taking longer than they expected. Um, but then eventually you get to see them get married. Uh, and you actually don't get to see the wedding ceremony, uh, but you do get to see that evening uh, whenever they are beginning to enjoy their very first moments of intimacy, uh, whenever they are actually getting to, uh, they're, they're about to consummate their relationship and you get to see them navigate uh, a very intimate and sensitive moment. And you get to see how to do that in a gracious and loving way that doesn't give birth to insecurities, but actually uh, heals them, right? Uh, and then you get to see them navigate conflict in marriage and how to keep the sparks alive in a budding relationship and an ongoing relationship. And really the whole story is just fantastic, right? And it seems like the main reason why God gave us this book was to teach us about how to handle love well, right? And how to love others as best we possibly can, right? Specifically in the context of marriage, but also more broadly in the context of human relationships and by proxy, our relationship with God. Uh, because ultimately we have to realize, and we see this more in the New Testament, ultimately marriage was created to point us back to God, right? And way back in Genesis, God said, it is not good for man to be alone, and therefore he created woman to be with man uh, in many ways to point man towards his need for God also, right? And so Song of Solomon, one of my favorite books in the Bible, um, I cannot encourage you to go study it more. Uh, just be careful on how you study it because... Um, since there is some more explicit sounding material in there, um, sometimes it's easier to gravitate the book for the wrong reasons. And that is one book that is really important because guess what? As humans, we need to know how to love one another well, right? It's important. And um, since most people will begin to move their way towards marriage eventually in life, um, that's also a very important thing to know how to navigate well, especially from a godly perspective. Right? It's not like God created this whole thing called marriage and then just said, like, go figure it out for yourself. No, he gave us guidelines and instructions to help us take care of this very sensitive relationship in a very um, life-giving way. Right? And so that's what Song of Songs is about. Then you have the Book of Wisdom, which we call Proverbs. Uh, and Proverbs is a really cool book um, that really just gives you practical wisdom for day-to-day -day living. Right? If you're looking for a single theme that dominates Proverbs, um, it would not be romance, um, but romance is mentioned. It would not be suffering, though suffering is mentioned. Um, the main thing that dominates Proverbs is wisdom in general. Right? It is really, um, some of it has connective tissue, but mostly it is just a series of disconnected sayings that Solomon and some other writers composed in order to give guidance and instruction to the future generations. And it is teaching them to govern themselves wisely. And many of them don't even mention God. Some of them do, right? The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom, right? That's one of the Proverbs. But some of them don't even mention God. Some of them are simply telling you this is a wise thing to do. One thing you need to keep in mind when you read the book of Proverbs is you have to remember that the book of Proverbs is detailing principles, not promises, right? What I mean by that is that um, whenever you read the book of Proverbs and you read one proverb and you go and do it and things don't turn out in life the way that the proverb suggested it would, you can't say that the book lied to you. Because the book is not saying these are promises and these are, this is how it's always going to work. Instead, the book of wisdom is telling you how to act wisely. right? And so it is saying that by and large, this is how life goes. right? There are always going to be exceptions to the rule. Right? But by and large, if you do this, this will happen. Right? So it'll say, uh, if you raise up your child with discipline and you train them up in the Lord, then whenever they grow older, they will not stray from the path. Okay, well, um, there are many, I will, I'll admit right now, there are many God-fearing parents who have raised up their kids, they've gone to church, they've discipled them well, but whenever the kids got older, they turned away from God. Mm. Does that mean Proverbs is lying to you? No, 
Because the book of Proverbs wasn't giving a promise, it was giving a principle. Because according to principle, it is more likely for your kid to be devoted to God if you raise them upright. Right? It, that is the wise way to do things. Right? It does, it's not guaranteed to work every time because ultimately you can't make your the kids' decisions for them. Right? Your kid is going to make the decision they're going to make. But if you are wanting to be a wise parent, you're giving your kid the best chances at being faithful if you are raising them up in the ways of the Lord. Right? And so that's an important thing to realize because sometimes people will say, oh, the Bible lied here because that didn't work for me. It's not making a promise. It is simply teaching you how to conduct yourself wisely. Right? That's an important thing to know. Another important thing to know is that sometimes um, it might seem like the book of Proverbs is contradicting itself. Right? There will be one verse that says, answer a fool according to his folly. And then the very next verse will say, do not answer a fool according to his folly. And you might look at that and, I mean, they look just outright contradictory. But what is the book trying to get us, get us to do? Think Use about our decisions. Okay. Use discernment. Yes. Discernment is very important. Yeah. Yeah, trying to get us to use discernment. Because the thing is, you read those two verses back to back, and what you should realize is that it's not contradicting itself. It's nuancing itself. Right? It is saying there's a time and season for all things. Right? Sometimes you need to answer a fool according to his folly. Sometimes you don't. Right? Uh, it's not like life isn't simply a series of black and white answers, right? There's a lot of gray in life. And if you're wanting to conduct yourself according to wisdom, rather than being quick to make decisions, what you need to do is you need to slow down, think things through, pray about it, and figure out the best god honoring way to go about things, right? There might be some times where a foolish person is being so foolish that they just don't even deserve an answer. You know what? You just move on. It's not even worth addressing. But there might be some times where they're doing something that is so harmful, it needs to be addressed. Or maybe they just don't realize they're being foolish and you need to call them out on it so that you can help them out, right? And so what you have to do is you have to learn, okay, do I need to speak or do I not need to speak? That's what the book's trying to teach you to do, right? And so the book of Proverbs is not trying to give you black and white answers to life because that's not what wisdom is. Knowledge is black and white. Wisdom handles the gray area, right? Because wisdom is teaching you to use discernment. Right? Wisdom is looking at life and saying, okay, now there are five different ways I can respond to this situation, and each of those five ways could be a God-honoring way. Wisdom is the thing that figures out which way is the best way. Right? And so that's what Proverbs is trying to teach you to do. Right? Um, so it'll tell you, oh yeah, um, don't marry a contentious wife. Right? Well, because that's probably not the wise thing to do. If you're wanting to have a healthy marriage where you're where your wife and you are constantly bickering, you probably don't want a nagging, contentious woman, yes. right? Uh, and so these are things that it's trying to teach you. Um, the way the Proverbs ends, Proverbs 31, is by detailing a... Um, oh, Amazon chair. <laughs> um, the way the Proverbs ends, Proverbs 31, is by detailing a virtuous woman and saying what a good, God-honoring woman looks like. Uh, and it goes through all these sorts of details talking about this. Uh, and one of the final things it says is that charm is deceitful and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Right? Uh, and does that mean that charm and beauty are bad? No. It just means that they're deceptive, right? Those are things that come and go, right? Um, you can be charming and beautiful for a few moments, right? I mean, if you put on enough makeup, you can make yourself as beautiful as you want to be, right? If you study a person long enough, you can figure out exactly what type of joke to say to make them laugh, right? So anybody can be charming and beautiful if they want to, right? And what the text is telling you is you don't want to base your life off of charm and beauty, right? Because those things, ultimately, those can deceive you, and long-term, they're fleeting, right? A person can only be charming so often, right? I mean, they're not going to be charming 100% of the time, right? Because life isn't always like that. Right? Where you can always be, oh, hey, what's up? How you doing? Sometimes you're going to be serious. Right? And you're not always going to be beautiful. Right? They might be beautiful now, but what about 60 years from now? Yes. Right? What if they got in a car wreck and their face is disfigured? Are you still going to love them then? Right? And so what the book is teaching is it's teaching you to navigate through life wisely. And it's teaching you to use discernment in how you approach things. And 
you don't only have to take that in regards to marriage. You can figure that out in regards to a lot of things, right? Why is it that I hang out with this group of friends? Is it because they're really good looking? Is it because I like them? Or is it because they fear the Lord, right? Is it their character that's drawing me to them? Or is it simply external stuff, right? And so the book of Proverbs is really just trying to get you to navigate life in the most positive uh, and God-honoring manner possible. And it's a very practical book. It is probably the single most practical book of the Bible. And it's the hardest book of the Bible to take out of context uh, because a lot of the verses are just disconnected, right? You can just take a verse of Proverbs and usually you can understand it on its own, right? Like the earlier chapters, there's a little bit more connective tissue and the last chapter, the same thing. Um, but the middle chapters, you can basically just take a verse and you can interpret it that way. So that's also mainly by um, Solomon. And then we have the book of Ecclesiastes. Oh, yeah. Right? Ecclesiastes is another one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, usually I would say that Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes are my favorite books, uh, which people are usually very surprised by because Song of Solomon is probably one of the most optimistic, lovey-dovey, romantic books of the Bible, and Ecclesiastes is probably one of the most dark and depressing books of the Bible. Uh, so they find it weird that those are my favorite, but in many ways I think they're just two sides of the same coin. Um, most likely Ecclesiastes was written later on in Solomon's life when he is, um, he's made some poor decisions. And we're going to talk about those poor decisions in a little bit. Um, but the book of Ecclesiastes is a sad, sad book. Right? Because as we see with Solomon, this was the wisest and richest man in the world. Right? He had everything at his fingertips. Yet the way this book opens up is with him saying, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Because he looks at the world and he realizes it's all fleeting, mm -hmm. right? And what Solomon does is he walks through every single aspect of life and he shows how none of it can truly fulfill you, right? He says, guys, whenever you look at life, it's like this endless cycle of redundant, monotonous repetition that just keeps on going and never satisfies you. The ear never has enough of hearing or the eye of what it sees, right? The rain will fall, but the seas will never be filled because eventually that rain will evaporate and only to fall again. It's an endless cycle. The sun will rise and the sun will set only to rise up from where it came. Where are we heading in life, right? He says, I, saw, I tried to see if wisdom would satisfy me, but it could not. I tried to see if pleasure could satisfy me. I denied myself no pleasure known to man. But in the end, it was meaningless, like chasing after wind, right? He says that he's like a dog chasing after a car, right? What does the dog do when it gets to the car? I don't know, right? What does the dog do? It's like, oh, okay, I guess the chase is over, right? But the imagery he uses is the person chasing after wind. You can't ever catch wind, right? Wind is constantly moving, constantly chasing, changing directions. You can't catch it. That's what he says it is like to find meaning in life. You're looking everywhere, you're trying to find meaning, and just whenever you're grasping it with your hands, it slips through your fingers, right? It's like fog, right? It muddies your vision and it makes things frustrating. He says, I devoted myself to building all sorts of houses and all sorts of buildings, and I devoted myself to great projects. Yet it was meaningless because for each project that I finished, I just wanted to do another one. And I realized that I could make all these things, that I could expand my kingdom to the ends of the earth. And in the year that I died, somebody could squander it all. And I imagine that when Solomon wrote that, he didn't even realize how true that would be. Because mm -hmm. the year after Solomon dies, his kingdom is going to be split in two. Mm -hmm. Right? So Solomon says, I can have all the wealth in the world. And it can be taken away in a moment. Right? You can have all this wealth. And if you make one bad business venture, you lose it all. Right? You devote endless decades to amounting this, to saving up this money, and then overnight it's gone. He says, if that is where meaning is found in life, then life will always frustrate you. And he says, even if I turn to folly, right, I turn to sin, and I embrace sin, but even that left it meaningless, because God's put eternity on man's heart. And when, when eternity is on your heart, you can't be satisfied with these temporal things, because they just come and go and come and go, and every person's heart is longing for something that will satisfy them eternally. But nothing on this earth will, right? Money 
it comes and goes. Wisdom, it comes and goes. Knowledge, it comes and goes. Pleasure, it comes and goes. Sin, it comes and goes. All of it comes and goes. There's a time and season for everything on earth, a time to reap, a time to sow, a time to cast stone, stones, a time to gather stones. He says there's a time for everything, but there's never a time to be satisfied. He says that's what I'm looking for. And the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about him trying to find meaning. And he finally says at the end, Remember your creator in the days of your youth while you were young, right? Before the days come, whenever you hate life and your, your bones are brittle and your body's aching and you finally think, wow, maybe I should think about God. He says, don't waste your life. He says, if you want to find meaning in life, fear God, keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. Because once you have feared God and kept his commandments, all of a sudden, all those meaningless things become meaningful. Because all of a sudden, all that money that you had, you're no longer relying on that money to give you meaning. Instead, that money becomes a gift from your creator that you can use to help provide for your family and provide for yourself. So now, like, there's a lot less pressure on the money, right? And rather than it being this idol that you're chasing after, it becomes just a gift that you get to enjoy, right? Whenever you are fearing God and keeping his commandments and you're finding your meaning in God, well, now you can enjoy wisdom. Now you can enjoy pleasure. Because now you're not using these things to validate yourself and you're not trying to find meaning in those things. Now you have found meaning in your creator, the only person who can actually satisfy you. And you find greater satisfaction in all these other things because these things were not meant to be your gods. Right? Money can't, it's not a sustainable God. Pleasure is not a sustainable God. Right? They will fail you. But God will not fail you. And so he says, fear God, keep his commandments. If you can do that, then all those meaningless things that we talked about, now they have meaning. Because things truly don't have meaning unless they first find meaning in their creator. And so that's what Solomon says. Great book, right? If you read it on the wrong day, like it's kind of been a gloomy day outside today, if you read Ecclesiastes on a day like this, you might get a bit depressed. Mm -hmm. um, but that's okay. Um, it won't make you nearly as depressed as the next book we're going to talk about, the book of Job. Um, the book of Job is one of the books of the Bible that we do not know who wrote it. People will debate about this. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that um, Job might have been one of the earliest books of the Bible written. Uh, we know that the story itself takes place during the time period of Abraham. Uh, and so if it was written during that time period, well, it was written before Genesis through Deuteronomy were written, right? Because Moses wrote those, right? Um, but we don't know when Job was written. We know when it was set. Um, but some people have speculated that maybe Solomon also wrote the book of Job, right? Maybe he was recording something that had been passed down for a long time, right? We don't know. But the book of Job is a very interesting book, right? It deals with suffering and it deals with hardship. And once again, all of these different things, I just want to highlight this. They're all things that we have to confront in life, right? Everybody needs to learn how to love. Everyone learn, needs to learn how to conduct themselves wisely. Everyone needs to learn... Um, what is the meaning of life? And everybody needs to learn how to deal with the fact that we live in a world where suffering is real, right? I mean, that's just a hard thing that we all have to realize, right? And it doesn't take that long, right? Whenever you have a loved one who dies, you know that suffering is real. Whenever you accidentally stub your toe on the corner of a bed, you know that suffering is real, right? Suffering is just a thing that we have to confront in life. And this book confronts it. Right, the way the book opens up is that uh, God is in his uh, heavenly council, right, the divine council, mm -hmm. and uh, this person known as the adversary comes in, and he says that he has been going about on the earth tempting people, and he wants a challenge, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? And mind you, Job is a very wealthy man, a very faithful man. And Job has everything. Job, when he starts off the book, he is on cloud 10, right? He is thriving. Everything's going perfect in his life. And so God asks, have you tried out Job? And they basically make a deal, right? And God tells the tempter, he tells the adversary, you can go down there and you can tempt Job, but you cannot touch Job himself, right? You can afflict him all around, but you cannot touch him. 
right? And basically, we're going to see whether or not Job is going to be faithful. And so, on one day, Job loses everything, right? He learns that all of his possessions, gone. All of his family, except for his wife, killed. In one day, his entire life falls apart. But he refuses to curse God. And instead, he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay, well, the tempter goes back and says, you know what? That's not fair. Job would curse you, God, if only you would let me afflict him. And so God says, go for it. Do it. Right? Afflict Job. And so all of a sudden, Job breaks out in these gross, nasty sores, and he gets all sorts of sick. And now, not only is he suffering mentally and emotionally because of what he's lost, but he's suffering physically. Right? And so not only has he lost his family, not only has he lost his possessions, he's lost his health. And so this guy, basically overnight, goes from having everything to having nothing. And to make matters worse, he's got these friends. And for about a week, these friends are really good friends who work with him. But after some time, they start getting to the serious questions that everybody would be wondering. Right? I mean, imagine this happened to somebody. Right? Imagine that overnight, somebody lost everything in life, and it wasn't just like an accident, right? Imagine that it was one thing after another to where it seemed miraculous, right? I mean, the thing is, like, nobody can look at what Job went through and say that it was simply natural disasters. I mean, it looks like the, like, it looks like supernatural beings are attacking Job, right? I mean, this is evidently a supernatural occurrence where everything is just lining up for Job to go through the most suffering possible. So his friends start asking what I think is a legitimate question. They're saying, Job, did you sin? Right? What sin did you commit that God is punishing you like this? And over the course of the next like 30-something chapters, Job and his friends begin to debate. Because Job insists that he did not sin and that his suffering is caused by something else. And his friends insist that that's not how God works. They say, Job, we get it, buddy, but you need to humble yourself. Because you're sounding very cocky right now. Because we know that God would not do this. God would not cause an innocent person to suffer. And we know, as the reader, we know that Job is innocent. Right? And so we know that Job is in the clear here. And that God does allow the innocent people to suffer at times. Right? And so that's the theology we have to be comfortable with. But Job doesn't know the backstory. Right? Job does not know what happened up in the throne room. Job simply knows what he's going through. And so him and his friends, they are duking it out back and forth. They are debating one after another. And Job is getting more and more miserable throughout all this. He never curses God, but he starts saying, man, I am so miserable. I wish I had never been born. Because if I'd never been born, man, I might not have had the opportunity to live. But at this point, dying sounds better than life. Because your your friends are making me miserable. And God's afflicting me. And this sucks. And he says, you know what? I wish that God himself would show up from heaven and testify on my behalf because he would tell you y'all are wrong. And he would tell you that I did nothing. And he would tell you why I'm going through this. And sure enough, at the end of the story, God shows up. Mm -hmm. However, God doesn't do what Job expected him to do. Right? Job, he was saying, God's going to show up and defend me. But God doesn't even speak to the other friends. Instead, God speaks to Job. Because Job says, basically, God, why am I going through this? Explain it to me. And God looks at Job and says, Job, were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? Were you there whenever I drew out the boundaries of the sea? Were you there when I created Leviathan? Were you there when I did this and that and this and that? No, you weren't there. So you don't get an answer. Right? And what he's calling Job to is faith. He's saying, you don't have to know the answers. I mean, could God have given him an answer? Absolutely. As the reader, we know the answer, right? We saw the interaction between God and the adversary. We saw how that whole thing went down. But Job doesn't get to know that. And that's really cool because that lets us know that whenever we go through things in life, we might not know the answers, but that doesn't mean God doesn't have an answer, right? Maybe we did sin and maybe we're being punished. Maybe... Like the blind man in the book of John, God has allowed us to suffer so the glory of God can be demonstrated through us whenever Jesus heals the blind man. 
maybe, like Job, God has allowed us to suffer so that he could test our faithfulness. Right? This is what the New Testament talks about a whole lot. Right? Rejoice in your trials because you know that tribulation produces endurance and steadfastness. Right? And it will make you perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Right? And so there's various different reasons we could go through this stuff. And the book of Job is reminding us we don't need to know those reasons. What we need to do is we need to learn to live by faith. Right? So that even if we don't have the answers, that's okay. And we don't need to expect God to give us those answers. Right? God can do what he wants, and we need to be okay with that. That's a tough pill to swallow, but that's what it is. At the end of the story, though, um, as reward for his faithfulness, Job does have his life in many ways restored. Right? To where by the end of the story, he ends up having twice as much as he had before. At the same time, um, sometimes people read this wrong, and they think that everything's better. Okay, all because you end up having a super big family doesn't take away the heartache of losing the first family, right? It's not like those children were resurrected, right? No, Job had to deal with that loss. He did not get those people back. But eventually there was future hope, right? And there was some sort of restoration, right? Yes? I was thinking that um, uh, when you pointed out that it was not better at the end, um, my mind immediately flashed to like uh, what John Redmond said at FVP about, um, I think it was in one of the booklets, but he was basically saying that uh, the 10 children that he once had that were killed before, mm -hmm. they're in heaven now. Uh, do you think that's true? Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, Yeah, because, you know, I mean, I, I'm assuming they're being faithful to God. Yeah, yeah. so um, he, he, the point he was trying to make was that it was... It, it didn't matter if they were dead or not, I guess, but you could interpret that as something that would still be heartbreaking to deal with. Yeah, I don't know if I would go that far, because if you're saying it doesn't matter, I think that would miss the point of Job, because the whole point yeah. is that it does matter, right? I mean, even if you have a newborn child who dies and you know they're in heaven, that doesn't take away the pain of that. Just right? missing that. I mean, like, whenever David's son died, like after the Bathsheba thing, mm. I mean, David says, I shall go to be with him but he's not coming back to me. Like, that doesn't take away the pain of what David went through. Right? right? David was still torn up by that, right? And so, um, I, I don't ever like to just, like, we, we don't want to downplay somebody's pain just by saying, oh, well, they're in heaven now. I see. Because, yes, there is that, but usually the reason why somebody's in pain is because of the loss they're experiencing, mm -hmm. not because of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's the loss of the relationship that people are missing, right? Okay. That's usually where grief comes from. Okay, so there are the books of wisdom. And now that we have talked about Solomon and his wisdom, let's talk about Solomon's folly. Because here in 1 Kings chapters 1 through 9, you see Solomon doing all these amazing things. It sounds like the story of the Bible is coming to its end, right? It seems like all the covenants are being fulfilled. God has come to dwell with his people. It sounds like a new heaven and earth is about to begin. But then when you get to chapters 10 and 11, you begin to notice that Solomon does some things he wasn't supposed to do. If you remember back in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, this is what God said. When you enter the land and you say, I will set a king over me, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Yahweh has said to you, you shall never again return that way. And he shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. So there are three things kings were not supposed to multiply. They weren't supposed to multiply horses, uh, because then you're trusting in chariots and horses rather than in God. You weren't supposed to be multiplying women, specifically because those women were usually political alliances, and they would be foreign women who would then lead you into idolatry, right? Lead you away from God. And thirdly, you weren't supposed to multiply gold or silver because if you were doing that, that means you were probably using your money to serve yourself rather than your people. Well, when you get to 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11, Solomon does all three things. Yeah. Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen and stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. Ironically, I mentioned that Solomon reigned during a time of prosperity and peace. He didn't need all these horses, but he had them anyways, right? Because he was becoming a worldly king. 
King Solomon loved many foreign women. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. Now the weight of gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Why not? Yeah, so King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. The king also made silver plentiful as stones in Jerusalem. And so, Solomon in the final years of his reign really messes things up. And this is what I'm talking about when I say that the Bible teaches you a little bit about human nature. Right? Whenever things are going really well, you know things are about to go bad. Right? And here we have Israel at the height of its prosperity. And then in two chapters, that is all stripped away, and Israel becomes worse off than it has ever been before. Because when you get to 1 Kings chapter 12, you have the divided kingdom. And the kingdom is going to remain divided for quite some time. Right? This is how the story is ultimately going to go down. Um, the year after Solomon dies, and his son Rehoboam becomes in charge, the kingdom is going to split in two, right? Ten of the tribes are going to go north, and they are going to become known as the northern kingdom of Israel. Two of the tribes, Benjamin and Judah, are going to go south, and they are going to be known as the southern kingdom of Judah. And it comes about in this way. Um, so towards the end of Solomon's reign, I talked about how uh, Solomon began to multiply gold and silver, right? Uh, and chariots and wives. Well, that's because towards the end of his reign, in many ways, he became more of a pharaoh-like figure, uh, where he was in many ways enslaving the people, right? And he became more of a tyrant. He became like King Saul. And so what God does is God tells this guy named Jeroboam that as punishment for what Solomon's done, he is going to give Jeroboam ten of the tribes of Israel, right? And only two are going to remain with Solomon and his heirs. And the reason why they're going to remain there is for the sake of David. Right, Since God made a covenant to David, David's sons are going to stay on the throne. But because of Solomon's sins, the kingdom is going to be split. And so, after Solomon dies, Rehoboam becomes king. Right, This is Solomon's son. And Jeroboam confronts Rehoboam. And he says, hey dude, I've got a request. Your dad was a jerk to us. Your dad enslaved us, basically. He made our burden so heavy. And he taxed us so greatly. Do you think you could maybe just relieve that burden a little bit for us? And Rehoboam goes and he asks his advisors what they should do. Right? And he says, how should I reply to the people? The first people he goes to are Solomon's advisors, the elders of Israel. Uh, and they give him very good advice. They say, because, I mean, if these are Solomon's advisors, you know they're probably pretty good. Because Solomon was a wise king. And they say, give Jeroboam what he wants. Right? Give them what they ask for and things will go well for you. But Rehoboam doesn't like that. Because Rehoboam's a king, right? And he grew up in a palace. And he knows that kings are only truly kings if they enforce their authority. And so instead, he goes to some of his friends, some vile group of men that he grew up with, and this is the advice that they give him to tell to Jeroboam. Thus you shall say to this people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now you make it lighter for us. Thus you shall speak to them. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. So now my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. The idea is he's supposed to make a very crude joke to just say, you thought my dad was bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. Right? He says, if you, like, you saw my dad's, uh, well, he says, my, my pinky is bigger than my dad's loins. Um, that's a dirty joke. The loins referring to the male appendage down there. He says, oh yeah, my pinky is bigger than my dad's down there. Oh. Right? And he says, oh yeah, my dad ain't nothing. You thought my dad was a tyrant? Oh, then you're going to be terrified of me. He's trying to flex his authority, uh, which this is often what people do, especially men. Men are very good at doing this, right? Men, whenever they're trying to, you know, this is like, you know, it's like puffing your chest up and like lifting up your chin. You're trying to show people how manly you are, right? You're trying to make them fear you. But that's not the quickest way to make people love you, yes. right? Uh, he should have given them what they wanted, but he was afraid that if he gave them what they wanted, 
then they would ultimately start, you know, stomping all over him and treating him like a doormat. And he says, I don't want to be a doormat. I want to be a king. And so he says this to them. And Jeroboam says, oh, I'm sorry. This wasn't a request. It was a demand. And if you're not giving it to us, then we're out of here. And so Jeroboam takes 10 of the tribes and they leave. And therefore, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom are born. There are going to be a bunch of kings, right? The northern kingdom of Israel is going to go through all these kings on the left. And the southern kingdom is going to go through all these kings on the right. You'll notice that the kings in blue are the good kings, the faithful kings. And the kings in gray are the bad kings. What do you notice about the kings in Israel? There are more bad kings than there are good kings, it seems. Um, well, yeah. Well, in the, Israel, there's no good kings. Right? In Israel, they're all bad. Right. In Judah, however, there are a few good ones. Not many, but there's a few. Mm. Another thing you need to know about the northern kingdom of Israel is that they're going to go through a bunch of different dynasties. Right? God had made Jeroboam a promise, and he said, if you are faithful to me, I will make your house like the house of David's, and it will endure. But Jeroboam wasn't faithful. Shortly after the, kingdom, the divided kingdom was built, well, Jeroboam led the people into sin, and they started worshiping golden calves, and they started worshiping idols. And so God said, okay, that's how it's going to be. That's how it's going to be. And so when you go through the northern kingdom of Israel, you'll notice that they are going through one dynasty after another, right? One king will reign, his son will reign, his son will be killed by somebody, and then the person who killed that king, he'll become the king, which is weird. That's not really how we do things nowadays, right? If you went and killed the president, you would not become the new president. Right. But that's how it was back then, right? And that's because what we talked about this. The way they viewed conflict back then was not simply man versus man. It was God versus God, right? And if God himself allowed you to kill the king, that was basically God giving his seal of approval that you were fit to be the new king, right? And so that's how they interpreted it. However, in the southern kingdom of Judah, there are going to be a few good kings, right? You've got Asa, Jehoshaphat. For those of y'all who have been with us on Tuesdays, we just talked about both of those guys. Uh, and then there's Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah, Josiah. All of those guys are good kings. And all of the kings in that line are all from the line of David. Because God has a covenant to David that he's fulfilling. Amen. Another thing I want you to notice is that you'll see when those two kingdoms were destroyed. Um, Israel was destroyed in 722 BC when they were exiled to Assyria. Judah is destroyed in 586 BC when they are exiled to Babylon. So Judah lasts 150 years longer than Israel, but I want you to notice that Judah didn't have that many more kings. And that's because things were a lot more stable in Judah than they were in Israel. Right? So when you look at Judah, you'll see that those kings, they reigned a lot longer than the ones in Israel. And so when you look at the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, you can think of them as being a very politically unstable society but religiously kind of stable. They were unified in their idolatry, right, which is bad. But as a result, they were politically unstable. However, the southern kingdom of Judah, um, they're politically pretty decent because they have one dynasty reigning for a very long time. That's really good. But spiritually speaking, they're very unstable, right? So sometimes they'll worship Yahweh. Sometimes they'll worship other gods. Sometimes they'll worship Yahweh and the other gods. They'll be all over the place. And so it's during this time period that God decides to change things up a little bit and he decides to send prophets to the people, right? And um, there have been many prophets already showing up throughout the text of scripture, but what sets these guys apart is that some of these guys write books and these books make it into our Bibles, right? We're going to talk about them again in a little bit, uh, but just so you know uh, where they fit in here, uh, Elijah and Elisha, uh, they don't write books of the Bible, uh, but they're very prominent in the books of 1st and 2nd Kings, uh, and they are ministering to the northern kingdom of Israel, right? And this is a little bit earlier on in the reign, specifically during the time of Ahab and um, the people shortly after that. Eventually, you have this guy named Hosea and Amos, and they are also both sent to the northern kingdom of Israel, right? Then you have all those other guys sent down to Judah, right? You've got Joel, Micah, Isaiah. Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, all these guys are sent down to Judah to get onto them. And then you still have other prophets who are sent elsewhere, right? You've got a guy named Obadiah who is sent to a place called Edom. Do you remember where Edom would be at on the map if you were to expand the map further? 
Wouldn't it be east of the Red Sea? Uh, not the Red Sea, but it'd be east of the, um, the Dead Sea mm-hmm. and a little bit south. Right? So Edom is down here to the south, uh, over here. So if this is Israel, to the right is Jordan, right, modern day. And if you go to the southern part of Jordan, that would be what we would call Edom. Right? This is, remember, the descendants of Esau. Right? So you can remember Obadiah was sent to Obad-Edom um, because he was sent there to get onto them because um, they had failed to take care of Judah and Israel during their time of need. And since Esau and Jacob were brothers, um, Esau should have taken care of Jacob and Israel. Right? So, uh, and then you have two prophets who are sent to Assyria, uh, and they're both sent to um, basically get onto them for their sin. Right? And the way you remember them is both of them have N-A-H in their name. Jonah Nahum. Right? God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah said, Nah, I ain't going. Well, eventually he went. Nahum was sent to Assyria, and the people of Assyria said, Nah, we're not repenting. And so you can remember that those guys were sent to Assyria because they both have na in their name, N-A-H, right? Jonah, Nahum. Nah means nah. Uh, yeah, and so you can just remember that um, when it's nah, right? Nah. Uh, and so those guys are also sent there um, for various different reasons, but also the messages that they're writing to those people have an impact on the people of Israel and Judah as well. Sound good? Mm-hmm. All right. So as you'll see, I'm condensing this down a whole lot. Uh, for those of y'all who are with us on Tuesday nights, we have just spent over half a year going through 1 Kings. And right now, I am jumping us to the end of 2 Kings. Uh, and that's because we're just doing big picture stuff. Uh, and so I'm not going to go in detail and talk about all the various different kings during this time period. Uh, the main thing you need to know is that it's very unstable. Prophets are sent. The people do not listen to the prophets. And so since they don't listen to the prophets, eventually they're going to be destroyed. In 2 Kings chapter 17, we read about the destruction of Israel whenever the Assyrians come in and lay it to waste. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and took Israel away into exile to Assyria and settled them in Hala and Hebor on the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Now this happened because the sons of Israel had sinned against Yahweh their God. Right, And so uh, there we have it that in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom of Israel comes to its end. Right? The Assyrians come in and they destroy them. Around the same time period, the Assyrians go down to destroy the southern kingdom as well. Uh, but there's a king named Hezekiah in charge of Judah at the time period. And Hezekiah is one of the good kings. And so since he repents and since he is faithful to Yahweh, um, Yahweh ends up causing the Assyrians to flee. Uh, And Judah is spared for the time being uh, of being destroyed. And so they get about an extra 150 years of time, uh, wherein prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah are sent to them. But eventually the people of Judah also um, are going to be destroyed. Uh, And we see the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC um, on a date known as the 9th of Av. The 9th of Av is the actual date according to the Hebrew calendar that Jerusalem fell. Uh, And even to this day, um, they, um, I don't want to say celebrate, they commemorate this day in Jewish cultures uh, because the 9th of Av is the saddest day of the year uh, because it is the day that Jerusalem was destroyed. And Jerusalem has been destroyed many times, but you have to realize that Jerusalem being destroyed in this instance is the biggest issue of all because this is when the kingdom was destroyed. Right? Jerusalem has been rebuilt and stuff, but we've never had a king sitting on the throne in Jerusalem like it was during the time period of the divided kingdom and united kingdom. So 586 BC, we read this at the very end of 2 Kings. Now on the seventh day of the fifth month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan burned the house of Yahweh, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Even every great house he burned with fire. So Judah went into exile from its land. And so no longer is it the Assyrians they have to worry about, but these people known as the Babylonians, they come in and they actually destroy Jerusalem. They burn down the city. They destroy the temple, right? This amazing temple that Solomon built laid to ashes. And all the people are taken off into captivity. And therefore, Jerusalem has fallen. It's a very, very sad moment. 
right? And like I said, this is the 9th of Av, 586 BC, and to this day, uh, the Jewish people still mourn about this event uh, because it, it's, just, it's just a heartbreaking moment, right? Because eventually they will come back to the land and they will rebuild the temple, but the temple will not be what it once was, right? They're going to rebuild it, but God's presence isn't going to come dwell in it the same way, right? It's not going to be like it was during the time period of Solomon, right? And so um, really, it, Second Kings is a very sad story, right? First Kings um, is the, well, First and Second Samuel is the rise of the monarchy, right? First Kings is the initial collapse of the monarchy, and Second Kings is just the destruction of all of it, right? Very, very sad event. And what we see going forward is that the people of Israel go into exile, right? They are taken captives and marched off into Babylon, uh, and many different stories are going to take place during this time period. Right? They're going to be there for 70 long years, uh, which is actually relatively short in the grand scheme of things. But in many ways, their exile will not fully end when they, re when they return back to the land. Uh, in many ways, their exile is going to keep on going, um, some would argue even to this day, um, because um, their Messiah will eventually come to them, but they're going to reject him. And so in many ways, their exile is still ongoing, and their exile will not end until they return to the Lord. However, the way that the Hebrew Bible ends in the book of 2 Chronicles is with the Persian king Cyrus saying this, right? Uh, so what eventually happens is this. During their exile, right, the Babylonians are conquered, right? The Persians come in, and they conquer the Babylonians, and the Persians had a totally different mentality when it comes to how they reign, right? The Babylonians, the way that they instituted their rule is by dispersing people. Right? So what they would do is they would take people out of their homeland and move them somewhere else. Right? It was a way of keeping people reliant on them and keeping people in submission to them. Does that make sense? Okay. Come on in. Thank you. You can set that down. Um, and so the Babylonians, they would take people captive and disperse them. Right? The Persians, however, they had a different mentality. And they said, okay, well, we actually want to be liked by people. So what we're going to do is we're going to let people go back to their homelands and those have to pay tribute or something like that. And so the way that Second Chronicles ends, and I'll remind you that Second Chronicles ends, uh, well, like in the Hebrew Bible, Second Chronicles is the final book. In our Old Testaments, we've got it organized differently, but in the Hebrew Bible, Second Chronicles is the end. We read this. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to complete the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he had a proclamation passed throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may Yahweh his God be with him and let him go up. Those are the final words of the Hebrew Bible. And so if you were reading through the Hebrew Bible from Genesis to 2 Chronicles, you begin with God and man dwelling together in a garden, and you end with this Gentile king instructing the Jewish people to go back home and build a temple so God could dwell with them again. Another thing I want to highlight here is whenever you get to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew is going to frame his presentation of the story of Jesus in the structure of the Old Testament. So... Just like the book of Genesis opens up with a metaphorical virgin birth, right? With Adam being created from nothing, right? Well, Jesus will be born of a virgin, right? Fun fact, after you get through the genealogy of Matthew, the very first word in Greek is Genesis. It says, now the beginning of Jesus Christ came about in this way, right? And as you read through the story of Matthew, he echoes the story of the Old Testament, right? To where you see Jesus... He is born of a virgin, and then he is delivered by a guy named Joseph who has a bunch of dreams, and he escapes death by going into Egypt, right? Just like in the book of Genesis, you have a guy named Joseph who has a bunch of dreams who takes the people of Israel to Egypt, right? Well, Jesus has a, dad, a stepdad, his name is Joseph, right? And so as you're going through the story, play by play, right? Jesus comes back, and he passes through waters, baptism, and goes out in the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, whenever Israel left Egypt, 
they passed through the Red Sea and went into the wilderness to be tempted by God, to be tested by God, 40 years. Right? So play by play. Right? Whenever Israel got through the wilderness, or they go Mount Sinai, where Moses went up the mountain to receive the law from God. Well, Jesus, he finishes being tempted. He goes up the mountain and delivers the Sermon on the Mount, where he begins to interpret the law of God. Right? So if you go through the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew is going play by play through the story of the Old Testament. Now think about how the Gospel of Matthew ends, the Great Commission. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, compare that to the end of the Hebrew Bible. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Well, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he is greater than Cyrus, right? Yahweh gave Cyrus the kingdoms of the earth. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Cyrus says, get up and go up. Jesus says, go and make disciples. Cyrus says, go and make a temple. Well, according to the New Testament, what is the new temple? Who's, who's the temple of God? The church, right? So when Jesus says, go and make disciples, he's saying... Go and make a temple. Right? So the Gospel of Matthew ends how 2 Chronicles ends. Right? 2 Chronicles is a good commission. Matthew ends with the great commission. Right? That's really cool. And so eventually, the people do return from exile. Right? They're going to come back. And this is where you get the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, Ezra, he is a scribe. Right? Uh, he is a guy who comes back, and Ezra is going to lead this massive revival in the land. Uh, where he is going to get people to take God very, very, very seriously. Right? And Ezra is probably the one who is most responsible for giving us the Old Testament as we have it. Right? He is probably the one who took all these books and kind of began to compile them together. Uh, specifically because they realized the people need to follow God. Right? And they realized if we were sent off into exile for our sin, we cannot do this again. Right? We have to make sure that we don't mess up again this time. And so he leads a revival where he stands up, everybody's gathered together, and he reads the law back to them. And they say, we, are, we'll, like, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. It's going to be great. Nehemiah, he's a guy who comes back, and he helps rebuild the city. Right? He is going to be in charge of helping rebuild the temple. And eventually, they're all going to rebuild the temple. I'm mean, sorry. He's going to be in charge of helping them rebuild the walls of the city. And eventually, they're going to come rebuild the temple as well. Right, uh, And so when you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you have to realize these are books of revival and rebuilding. Right, These are people who have been punished for their sin. They have really messed up, but they come back and they're hopeful to start again. Right, And they realize they've been given a new opportunity by God to do things differently this time. Mm -hmm. However, there are some people who decide not to come back from exile. Um, there are some Jews who... During the time of exile, they got used to being away. Uh, and so these people become known as the Jews of the dispersion, right? People who are scattered abroad. We have one book that is written by one of these, like about one of these Jews. Do you know what book it is? Daniel. So yes, but that's actually during the exile. We'll talk about Daniel in a second. What book is it? It's named after a woman. Esther. Esther, yes. Um, the book of Esther is set, it, it could very well chronologically be one of the last books of the Bible. Um, it, it's getting around the time period that Malachi is writing and stuff like that. Um, Esther is one of the Jews who decided to stay scattered uh, once the Jews came back from exile. Right? Esther is living in the land of Persia, because remember I said the Persians conquered the Babylonians? Well, Esther's living in Persia, and her story is very interesting. Because when you read the entire book of Esther, you will see that the name of God is never mentioned. However, this, the events that take place in that book are so coincidental that it's hard to argue that God is not there, right? Because there's no way that there's not a divine hand governing all the things you see happening in the book of Esther. The way the story plays out is this. Um, there's this king. His name is Ahasuerus. But uh, if you look at broader history, history knows him better as a name Xerxes. Anybody in here ever seen the movie 300? Yes? So King Xerxes in 300, 
is the same as King Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. Right? So the guy who fought the Spartans, um, he is actually the same king as the book, from the book of Esther. Um, in 300, he's a bad guy, but in Esther, he's actually a good guy. So the story goes like this. King Ahasuerus is throwing a banquet. And the banquet's going super well. Everybody's probably super drunk. And he decides that he wants his wife to come to the banquet. And so he calls for her. Her name is Vashti. However, Vashti doesn't want to come. Right? Vashti is throwing a banquet of her own, and she probably knows what the king's going to have her do. Right? The king's probably wanting her to come out there and like show herself off and probably do something sensual or something like that. And she doesn't want to do that. She doesn't want to be praying around. And so she tells the king, no, I'm not coming to your banquet. And the king says, um, I wasn't asking. I'm the king. You're my queen. Get out here. And she says, no. And she says, okay, fine then you're not the queen anymore. And he banishes her. Uh-oh. Well, now, the king needs a new queen, doesn't he? And so what he does is he gives out a casting call, right? And he calls for them to assemble all the most beautiful virgins from throughout the land and to bring them in, and they are going to have one night with the king where they are going to try to earn his affection and win his heart. There's this woman named Hadassah, a Jewish woman named Hadassah, who is going to be amongst these women who is picked, uh, and her name is changed to Esther. Right? Esther most likely comes from the, uh, the pagan god Ishtar. Right? Uh, and so Esther, she's a Jewish woman. Nobody knows she's Jewish, though. Right? Um, and so she is picked, and she goes, and she becomes uh, one of the king's harem. Right? And for probably a year or two, um, they are pampered. Right, these women are taken care of to a high degree uh, where they just have like, you know, it's basically like they just go to a spa and a salon for like two years straight just to make them as beautiful and elegant as possible. Right, where they're probably just going through all sorts of luxury things just so that they can have that one night with the king to see who will win his heart. Well, that night comes and Esther wins. Um, I am going to put this in the most PG way possible, um, but I will just remind you here that this is most likely not PG stuff happening on this night, right? Uh, if you're spending one night with the king, I doubt that they spent the entire night playing Uno, right? Most likely, um, this is not the godliest night in the world, especially for unmarried people. Uh, but, uh, what we're going to see is that we're going to see God working through these vile circumstances to produce some good things in the end, right? Uh, and so whatever happens, Esther ends up winning the heart of the king and she is proclaimed the new queen of Persia. That's pretty cool, right? All right, side story now, right? Because it's going to get more complicated. Esther has a cousin named Mordecai. And Mordecai seems like a father figure to Esther. Oh, we don't know what happened to Esther's parents. Uh, but it seems like Mordecai is the one who mainly raised her. And Mordecai is the only other one who knows that Esther is Jewish, right? Well, uh, Mordecai is a pretty prominent guy, right? There was this one moment uh, where people were planning an assassination attempt against the king, and Mordecai stopped it, right? And so Mordecai has a pretty good reputation. He's never been repaid for this, though, right? He's never been repaid for what had happened there. Um, but he's got a good reputation and stuff, and he's a faithful Jew. Well, there's another guy named Haman. Right? And Haman is one of the king's highest secretaries, very proud man. And Haman, um, he is so esteemed by the people that whenever he goes throughout the land, if people see him, they are expected to bow down before him. There's one person who refuses to do this, though, and that is Mordecai. Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman. And so Haman gets very, very upset. And Haman decides, you know what? I'm going to have Mordecai put to death. And so he has an entire gallows constructed so that he can have Mordecai killed because he absolutely hates Mordecai. Okay. Well, one night, the king is sleepless. He can't sleep. Right? And he needs something to help him go to bed. And you know the best way to go to bed? Have somebody read a history textbook to you. And so, he tells one of his people, he says, you know what? Go get one of the records from the, um, from the shelf and read it to me. 
And so a guy goes and he begins to read the book to him. And in the book, it is recounting this story where this guy named Mordecai stopped this assassination attempt against the king. And the king says, whoa, has Mordecai ever been paid back for this? And they said, no. And so the king gets up and he goes for a walk. And who does he come across? Haman. Amen. And he says, Haman. <laughs> and he says, hey, man. <laughs> okay. He says, hey, man, I got a question for you. He says, all right. So let's say that there was this person who had done this amazing thing for the king. And the king wanted to elevate this person and exalt him before everybody and show him how grateful he was for this person. What do you think I should do for that man? Now, Haman hears this, and who does he think the king's talking about? Yeah. He thinks the king's talking about himself, because Haman, he, he wants to be the king's favorite. And he does all this stuff for the king. He thinks the king's talking about himself, and he says, all right, king. Well, if you were going to exalt such a man, I think you should give him this amazing horse, and you should give him these amazing clothes, and you should make people bow down before him, and yada, 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 yada. He goes on this long list of stuff. And the king says, that is a great idea. Now I want you to go and I want you to do that for Mordecai. And Haman hears this. And Haman is ticked. Because oh. Haman hates Mordecai. Mm. Right? And he's like, wait. That's the stuff I wanted for myself. And now I've got to give it to my most bitter enemy. And now I can't even have this enemy killed. And so what Haman decides to do is he says, if I can't kill Mordecai, then maybe I can convince the king to kill all the Jewish people. And so... Since Haman has a lot of power, he gets the king's permission to set in motion this plan to commit mass genocide and kill all the Jewish people in the land. But Mordecai hears about this. And Mordecai calls for Esther and says, Esther, maybe God put you as queen for such a time as this. Right? I don't know why. All, like, he doesn't say God, right? God, once again, God's never mentioned. But he says, maybe you were put there for such a time as this. Because... I don't know why you're queen, but your people are about to be exterminated. You need to go before the king and beg for our lives. But she knows she can't just do that, right? Because the king hasn't called for her any time recently. He's been busy with his own stuff. He probably has all these other women he's sleeping with. And you can't just go before the king, but she needs to. Because the date is coming when the people are going to be killed. And so she's like, okay, well... I mean, I'd have to go into the king while he's sitting on the throne. And we already know that the king doesn't like it when women usurp his authority. Because the last queen got kicked out for that. She says, I'd have to go in then. And he could have me killed. But she does it. She goes in while the king is on the throne. And he extends his scepter to her. And he says, what would you like, my darling? Right? So he actually, like, he actually cares for her enough and doesn't punish her. And she says, King, would you and Haman like to come to a banquet tomorrow night? And he's like, uh, sure. <laughs> he's like, okay. It's kind of weird. Um, I, I couldn't have waited till later. Uh, but he says, sure, we'll come. Well, they come to the banquet the next night. And they say, so what did you want to talk about? And she says, can we have another banquet tomorrow? And he's like, Okay. And they come the next night. And then finally Esther tells him the truth. She says, King, here I am, your queen. But one of your own people is trying to have me killed. And he's furious. What do you mean somebody's trying to have my queen killed? Who would do this? And she says, My love, I, I'm a Jew. I know you don't know that. But I'm Jewish. My name is Hadassah. And... Somebody is trying to kill my people. And, she says, and he says, who would do such a thing? And she says, Haman. And he is furious. How dare Haman try to kill the people of his queen? However, there's an issue. Because according to the rules of the law, like the, like the nation, you couldn't repeal an act. Like once the king's seal had been on it, you couldn't repeal it. And so he can't stop the Jewish people from being executed. But he can give another edict that allows the Jews to fight back. Right? And so Haman is killed. He's executed. 
And in a twist of fate, he is executed on the very gallows he had prepared for Haman, uh, for Mordecai. Right? So he actually ended up making his own death instrument. But then, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, they get to fight back. And they end up surviving. And at the very end of Esther, a new celebration is instituted. A celebration known as the Feast of Purim. Right? Uh, nowadays, it's celebrated basically as the Jewish Halloween. Um, whenever I was in Israel a few times ago, back in like 2018 or something like that, um, I was talking to a Jewish guy about Purim, and he said, yeah, basically this is our excuse to just go get drunk and dress in costumes. And <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Um, but really, the book of Esther is um, its a book that serves the purpose of showing, um, firstly, how, why Purim exists, right? But it also shows how God is faithful to his covenants, even when his name isn't mentioned, Right? God does not directly show up in the book, yet he orchestrated all the events to work out so that Esther was queen at a time period where she could save the people, right? And when Mordecai was going to be executed, instead he was exalted, right? God is working behind the scenes, and like he said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and those who do not, I will curse, right? And so that's what the book of Esther is all about. Uh, It's just a very fascinating book with all sorts of coincidences, uh, a very compelling story. Um, and it's only like 10 chapters long. So it's, it's very short as well. And so that chronologically gets us to the end of the Old Testament. But there's still a few more books we need to go back and talk about. Uh, ben, were you going to say something earlier? Yeah, all I was going to say is uh, Haman's downfall reminds me of a proverb that goes, uh, pride goes before destruction and a, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Mm. Yep, for sure. All right. So we have worked chronologically through the Bible. Now what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the prophets. right? We've already talked about them a little bit, but I want to give you a little bit of a foretaste of each of them. Uh, And then, believe it or not, by the end of today, we're going to be done with the Old Testament. There you go. So um, first off, we have the book of Isaiah. right? Isaiah is 66 chapters long, and it was written to the southern kingdom of Judah uh, around the time period, uh, really a pretty long time period, uh, but really the turning point of Isaiah takes place during the time period of Hezekiah. And this book, in many ways, uh, some people have called it the fifth gospel um, because it is so gospel-centric, right? Um, chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah are written to the southern kingdom uh, during the time period when the Assyrians are the big bad guys, right? So it's around the time period when the northern kingdom of Israel is being destroyed. Right? That's whenever the first part of Isaiah is being written. Chapters 40 through 66 are written in light of the coming exile by the Babylonians. Right? So that's a few hundred years away, but Isaiah is prophesying the future and seeing that destruction coming. And whenever you read through this book, you cannot help but see gospel truth on every single page. Um, Isaiah is one of the guys, like, like everything he's talking about, he's talking about this future king who will come and he will be the prince of peace, right? He will be mighty God. He will be Emmanuel, right? The word Emmanuel is probably one of the driving things in the entire book, right? Because uh, early on you have Isaiah confronting a king um, over um, basically while Assyria was growing in power, um, the people of Judah were trying to figure out what to do, right? They were trying to strike alliances with all these sorts of people so that they could defend themselves against Assyria, And Isaiah shows up and says, you don't need alliances. All you need is to be faithful to Yahweh. If you keep his covenant, and if you are faithful to him, Assyria will be no big deal. And so he says, what sign will you ask from God for him to demonstrate this to you? And the king, Ahaz, he replies and says, I wouldn't ask for a sign. And Isaiah says, well, God's going to give you a sign either way. The young woman will give birth to a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel, God with us. When you see this child born, you will know that God is with you. And sure enough, as you read the story, God proves that he is with the people. Ultimately, Hezekiah prays to God and stuff like that. The Assyrians are banished and things go well. However, in chapter 39, Hezekiah, the good king, he makes a big mistake. And he decides to allow his pride to get the best of him. And as a result... Isaiah says, all right, you didn't have to be afraid of Assyria, but you do have to be afraid of Babylon. 
Because since you have sinned and you have turned from me, Babylon will come in and destroy you. And so, chapters 40 through 66 are anticipating the future captivity that's going to come from Babylon. Right? And so the way that chapter 40 opens up is actually predicting John the Baptist. Right? It says, comfort, comfort my people. Right? A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare a way for Yahweh. Right? Make straight in the highway, a pathway for our God. Right? It's saying, like, and John the Baptist says this is who he is. Right? He is a voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the people to return from exile. Right? And so God is promising that there will one day be this person who will be able to bring the people back from their actual exile. And when you get to those final chapters of Isaiah, he begins to predict what this servant will look like. Right? Who will this person be who will save the people? And he describes him as a suffering servant. Right? A faithful servant of Yahweh who has the spirit of Yahweh fall upon him. He will go and perform these miraculous acts. Right? He will make the blind see. He will make the deaf hear. He will make the mute speak. He will make lepers cleansed. He will make the lame dance for joy. But he'll be rejected by the people. Like a lamb to the slaughter, so he will not open his mouth. And like a sheep before it shears is silent, so he will not open his mouth. Right? By his stripes, the people will be healed. He'll be buried with criminals. But... Will be buried. Well, he will die with criminals, but will be buried in a rich man's tomb. Right? But eventually he will receive the inheritance of all the nations. Right? Isaiah says all these things, right? This person, this suffering servant, is going to show up, and he will be the people who he, he will be the one who ultimately brings the people back from exile. Right? So yes, the people might come back from Babylon, as we already talked about, but their exile wasn't fully over. Right? The exile could only truly end whenever the sacrificial lamb had laid his life down, right? And so when you get to the New Testament, you have the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? John the Baptist shows up and he says, the suffering servant is here, right? Isaiah paves the way for all of that. Jeremiah, um, we call him the weeping prophet, right? And the reason why we call Jeremiah the weeping prophet is because this dude was just sad. Uh, and... and I mean, he had every reason to be sad because Jeremiah is writing quite a bit after Isaiah. Uh, he is writing during a time period uh, whenever Judah is on the verge of collapse, right? He, like, Jeremiah begins writing during the final years of Judah. He is present in Jerusalem when Jerusalem is destroyed, and he continues writing a little bit afterwards, right? And so this guy, I mean, in general, being a prophet is not a fun job. Right? Nowadays, like we say so much, like, oh, I just want to serve the Lord. You should want to serve the Lord, but you shouldn't think that serving the Lord is always going to be a fun thing to do. Right? Whenever we think of like serving God, we think, oh, I just want to like bring millions of people to Christ. That's not what the prophets did. Right? Uh, and that's not what the apostles did. I mean, the apostles brought a lot of people to Christ, but they also suffered for it. The, the prophets, a lot of the times, they were commissioned by God to speak to people who would not listen. And they knew that ahead of time, right? They knew that they were going to dedicate decades of their lives proclaiming a message and nobody would listen, right? That is like a pastor committing to preaching at a congregate to a church where there's not a single person in the pew. And he does it week after week after week, right? That's what the prophets do. And Jeremiah has probably got it the worst of all of them because he, like Jeremiah, he comes from Jerusalem. He was born and raised there. Jerusalem is his home. He loves the people of Jerusalem, but he knows they're sinners, and he knows destruction is coming. And as a prophet, he can see what is happening. Like, he can see clearly what is coming, but nobody believes him. And so he's warning people, the end is near, the end is near, the end is near, yet no one listens. And they keep on sinning. And then eventually he is there when it's destroyed, and he cries out. And he writes another book because of it, the book of Lamentations. It's called Lamentations because he is lamenting the fall of Jerusalem, right? And so Jeremiah is a sad book, right? You read that. It, I mean, Lamentations is even sadder. Ironically, the only part of Lamentations you'll ever hear quoted is the one verse in Lamentations that is positive is the verse that says his mercies are new every morning, uh, which is ironic because to me it seems like people have missed the whole point of Lamentations. <laughs> the whole point of the book is that it is sad. Um, and... 
the whole reason Jeremiah had to write his books is because the people of his time period refused to listen to his sad words, right? The people of his time period only wanted to hear positive things. And ironically, um, the only verses that people usually know from Jeremiah's words are the positive things, right? What is the most popular verse in Jeremiah? 29.11. Jeremiah 29.11. Oh, yeah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to give you a hope and a future and to prosper you. I think we've missed Jeremiah's point as well, right? What we've done, if you read the rest of Jeremiah chapter 29, it is a sad chapter. We've taken the one verse that is good, and that's the only verse we learned. We're doing exactly what the people did at Jeremiah's time, right? Because the people at Jeremiah's time, they said, we don't want to hear your negative stuff. We want to hear encouragement. We want to hear positive stuff. And Jeremiah's like, I would tell you positive stuff if there was positive stuff to say. But he says, guys, the Babylonians are coming, and you're not repenting. Get your act together. Right? Because you're going to go off into exile. And Jeremiah 29 is written to the people in exile. And he is saying, guys, I know you think God's going to bring you back soon, but he's not bringing you back soon. You need to make a life for yourself in Babylon because you're going to be there a while. But don't worry. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to give you hope in the future. He says, eventually your grandkids are going to come back here and they're going to thrive because God has plans for Israel and he's not abandoning them but you are going to die in your sin, right? Uh, Jeremiah 31 predicts that God will make a new covenant with the people because the former covenant, well, that wasn't really working out, was it? Right? He gave them the law written on stone and they refused to listen. They refused to hear him. And so instead he says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And this one, I'm going to give my spirit to you. And I'm going to write my law on your heart. And I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. And you're going to love me. And you're going to return to me. Right? And so the book of Jeremiah, uh, it is the longest book um, in the entire Bible. Um, Psalms is the longest when it comes to chapter count. But Jeremiah is the longest when it comes to word count. Um, Very long book. Very sad book. Lamentations is pretty short. But it is probably the saddest book in the Bible. Like I said, there's like one verse that's positive. Uh, And then you have Ezekiel. Ezekiel uh, is written during the time period when the people are in exile. And Ezekiel, as you can see by this picture, is a trippy, trippy book. Um, If Ezekiel were not a book that was inspired by God, and if it were not in the Bible, uh, and if I were to read the book of Ezekiel and just give my educated guess as to how it was written, I would naturally assume that this guy wrote it while on mushrooms or tripping on LSD. Obviously, I do not believe that because I believe this was a prophet of God. But the book is a weird one. And it makes sense, right? He's living in Babylon. He is writing to people and um, he's using a lot of Babylonian imagery to convey things. Uh, And this dude is having some weird, weird visions. And you can tell that he's trying his best to convey heavenly realities in earthly terms. And that's just not possible, right? He's like, I saw the throne room of God and there were these angelic creatures and they had like, four heads and six wings and and there were eyes everywhere and there were these wheels and they were spinning in circles and there was fire and rainbows and like you can tell that this guy has just like had this like download of like information that he does not know how to make sense of and he's trying to explain it to your everyday human right uh and ezekiel uh, is another very intense book because once again it's written during the exile right the people have still not repented and they need to hear about Harsh things, right? So he writes some of the book to the people back in Judah who are still not fully exiled. And he writes some of the book to the people in exile. And he's getting onto them and saying, get your act together. But like the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel also predicts that the day is coming when God will make a new covenant with man, right? And even though the people of Israel and Judah are being chastened, and even though they're being disciplined, God has not abandoned them. And God is planning on taking care of them. And he will give them a new heart. He will give them the law written on that heart. He will give them his spirit. And those dead bones will come alive. Right? The dry bones, yeah. Sorry, that's what I meant. The dry bones. And so Ezekiel is another very interesting book. It's very intense. Um, Whenever you read the book of the prophet, the books of the prophets, Um, you'll encounter a lot of language that would make your mother blush, right? Um, Which, 
Um, I, I think it's good. I think we need to read these books more uh, because I think that as Christians, we've adopted a very sanitary view of God uh, in a very, uh, I don't know, like a very Sunday school appropriate view of Christianity um, that I think overlooks the harder things that the Bible has to teach. Right? I don't think that's good. I think we need to be, like if we want to understand God as best as possible, we need to read all that he has given us and we need to wrestle through the harder things. And there is some language that God uses in Ezekiel that you're like, wow, I can't believe God would say that. You're like, whoa, that is wild. But it's important for us to read it because we need to realize that this is God. And the view of God that you usually hear on Sunday mornings, you need to be able to reconcile with this God. Because you can't just like, because if you ignore certain books of the Bible, you're going to have a God in your own image. You're not going to have the God of the Bible, right? And so we have to read all of them, and we have to be comfortable with that. And if it makes us uncomfortable that God speaks this way, the issue is not with God, it's with us, right? And so um, we need, like, sometimes people are afraid to do that. They're like, oh, I don't know, I want to stay away from that. You can't do that, right? You have to be willing to read it all, right? And so I would encourage you to read Ezekiel, but it will challenge you. Uh, I probably wouldn't um, encourage you to read the book of Ezekiel to your five-year-old um, as they're trying to go to bed at night, unless you want them to have nightmares or have a lot of very important, weird questions that you might not be ready to answer yet. Um, but it's something that we should read. Yes? Currently, for your information, I'm actually in Ezekiel for my bi- daily morning Bible time. Yeah, what chapter are you in? Uh, eight. Mm. Mm. For my, I mean, well, I haven't really been reading through the prophets because I got this I'm going through. Uh-huh. But, well, whenever you get to Ezekiel 23, you're going to have to tell me what you think. That is, uh, Ezekiel 23 is one of the wildest chapters in the entire Bible. Okay, so Ezekiel also, a very good book. Uh, and at the same time period that Ezekiel is writing his book, another guy starts writing his book as well. And this is the prophet known as Daniel. A cool thing about Daniel is that Daniel was one of the Jewish people who was exiled Uh, And he is actually going to live through the entire exile. So Daniel actually lives a pretty long life, right? Daniel, uh, he is a teenager whenever the Babylonian captivity starts. And he is one of the first teenagers exiled into Babylon. And so you get to see him and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They are adjusting to life in Babylon and trying to learn how to be faithful to God in the midst of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, And it's during this time period that you have stories like the fiery furnace stuff like that, Uh, and also, you know, Daniel in the lion's den, right? All that stuff happens. Uh, But Daniel is also there um, after a long time whenever the Persians conquer the Babylonians, right? And Daniel actually is there on that night when it happens, right? When Darius the Mede comes in and does all that stuff. Uh, This is where you get the famous story of the handwriting on the wall. Remember whenever a hand shows up and writes Mene, Mene, Tekken, Parson, and nobody can figure out what it means? But Daniel can interpret it. And he basically says, oh, this says that y'all are screwed. (laughs) It says that, yeah, y'all are about to be destroyed like tonight. And sure enough, that night they're destroyed. Right? And Daniel is there. So Daniel, like, he's a very unique spot, right? He gets to be there throughout the Babylonian captivity and going into um, the Persian time period as well. So he's here during all this. And whenever you get to the back chapters of Daniel's book, Uh, This is where you actually get some of the trippiest and weirdest visions in the entire Bible. Uh, But also you get some of the coolest prophecies ever, right? You get, like, there are some prophecies that you look at in the book of Daniel, uh, and people who are not Christians or Jewish people, right, people who do not believe these are inspired by God, the only explanation they can give is they have to argue that Daniel was written a lot later than it was because some of the prophecies are so specific that even a person who's not a historian can read them and say, oh, that's obviously talking about Alexander the Great. Well, you can just read it and you can read what it's describing and play by play, it tells you about this figure who's gonna show up and do this thing. And you're like, that's obviously Alexander the Great. But he wrote it way before Alexander the Great was even alive. And you're looking like, so some of the coolest prophecies are in the book of Daniel where it's very specific. We even talked about one of them today in church, right? Uh, and, and so uh, the book of Daniel is really cool. Uh, we're going to bring out Daniel a little bit more whenever we get into the New Testament because um, a lot of stuff Jesus says hinges on what Daniel says. Uh, 
and he also Daniel also tells us a lot about end time stuff as well. And really, a lot of the prophets deal with end times things in general. Um, if you're wanting to understand the book of Revelation, you can't just read Revelation by itself, right? If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you need to know the Old Testament really well, especially the prophets, right? If you know the prophets, you can understand Revelation easily, right? Um, if you know the whole Old Testament, it becomes even easier than that, right? Uh, because a lot of what, like, ba Revelation basically introduces nothing new in the Bible, right? Everything new that the book of Revelation in introduces, it explains, like, if it, if it is introducing something that has not been seen in the Bible yet, it will say, oh, yeah, and by the way, this is what it means. If it is something old, you just got to go read the Old Testament, and the Old Testament will explain it, right? And so that's why a lot of times people don't understand Revelation is because we don't study our Old Testaments very much, do we? Right? We study the New Testament, and then we look at Revelation, and we're like, oh, my gosh, what is this? But if you know the prophets and stuff, Revelation becomes super easy. It doesn't mean that you can understand every little thing, but it becomes way easier. Were you going to say something, Paul? Yes. Um, okay. I was, I was always thinking that Revelation, since it's the final book of the New Testament, um, at least in our Bibles, mm -hmm. probably probably any Bible anyway, yeah. um, I like to think of it as like the finale of the Bible. And of course oh, it, it is. is. Yeah, because it like takes everything into account the Bible uh, introduced previously, and it feels like, like almost like God's final chapter yeah. in the Bible. Uh, or, you know... Uh, I think that's a pretty accurate view of it, then. Yeah. No, that, that's 100%. Revelation is the big finale. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking. Um, okay, and so um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Uh, in our Bibles, those are what we call the major prophets, uh, mainly because they're longer, right? Uh, Lamentations isn't that long, but since it was written by Jeremiah, we kind of lump it in there with it, right? And then you have what we call the Book of the Twelve. Uh, which in our Bibles, we separate into 12 different books, right? Uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Hosea and Amos are both written to the northern kingdom of Israel, mm -hmm. right? Um, Joel, Jonah, oh, sorry. Okay, let me just go through. Okay. Hosea is written to the northern kingdom of Israel. Joel is written to Judah. Amos is written to Israel. Obadiah is written to... Do y'all remember? Edom. Edom. Very good. Obadiah is written to Edom. Jonah is written to... Assyria. Assyria. Micah is written to Judah. Nahum is written to... Assyria. Assyria. Habakkuk is written to Judah. Zephaniah is written to Judah. And all of those are before the exile. Right? Mm -hmm. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are all written after the exile. Right, uh, And so none of these books were written during the exile, uh, but you do have Ezekiel and Daniel written during that time period, and Jeremiah. Right? Um, we're not going to go through each of these books. Um, instead, real quick, just since we're running out of time here, um, I'm just going to give you an overview of just some significant ones. Uh, all of them are really worth studying. I think that I'm actually about to, to go more in-depth into these um, probably in like a month or so. Um, Hosea, um, there is actually a, a, a brief storyline in Hosea uh, where the book of Hosea is all about um, basically God instructs a prophet to go and marry a prostitute named Gomer. Uh, and even after he marries her, the woman goes and sells herself back into prostitution and cheats on him. And God tells Hosea to go and purchase her back. And the reason why is because Hosea is basically living out God's relationship with Israel, right? Because since Israel keeps turning to idolatry, and keep, re keeps rebelling against God, she is like an adulterous wife. And so he needs Hosea to understand his pain in order to be able to communicate his message. Right? So that's what Hosea is about. Um, another one, people are pretty familiar with the book of Jonah. Right? Jonah, um, you're usually more familiar with that one because that is the one, like, that is the easiest of the prophets to understand because it's narrative. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but usually people still miss the, under, miss, like, miss the whole point of it. Um, usually people think about like Jonah, they're like, oh, well, don't we all run from God a little bit? Yes. But really, the book of Jonah is primarily about um, our tendency to accept grace for ourselves while denying it towards others. Mm. Right? Because um, Jonah was all about, like, here he was running away from God, and he was willing to be forgiven by God, yet he was not willing to forgive the people of Nineveh. Mm. Right? Even though Nineveh repented immediately. Right? And so Jonah is highlighting the fact, like, it was written... So, like, he is ministering to the Assyrians, 
but it was written for the people of Judah and Israel, right? Because it's trying to teach them, y'all are the villains of the story. Uh, Habakkuk is another guy who's wrestling through the problem of evil, right? He sees all the evil going on in the people in the area of Judah, and he says, God, when are you going to judge these people? And God says, oh, I'm going to. I'm sending the Babylonians. And Habakkuk says, the Babylonians are worse than the people. He says, how can you judge a less sinful people with a more sinful people? And God says, the righteous will live by faith. So he basically responds to Habakkuk the same way he responded to Job. He says, you're not going to understand everything, and that's okay. Right? Trust me. Um, when you get to Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, like I mentioned, those are the post-exilic prophets. Um, they're writing to the people after they return from exile, and that's because, like I said, even though they physically return from exile, um, not everything is perfect, right? There's still a spiritual exile that's ongoing, and so there's certain things that they need to be gotten onto for. Zechariah, he has a bunch of weird visions, um, but it's a really cool book. Uh, and Malachi is the final book in our Old Testament, and chronologically speaking, it is probably the last book of the Bible to be written, other than possibly Esther. And in Malachi, um, just, just to set up where we're eventually heading with this, uh, the way the book of Malachi ends is with God making a promise. He says that he is going to send a messenger to prepare the way for the Lord. And then the Lord will suddenly come into his temple and he will restore the sons of Levi. Right? So basically he's saying that God's going to come back to the temple. Right? And he is going to fix the priests, and he's going to bring them back to him. Which is ironic, because what we're expecting is that God's going to descend into the temple like he did with Solomon. But when he gets to the New Testament, instead what we have is John the Baptist preparing way for Jesus, and Jesus shows up at the temple, what does he start doing in the temple? Flipping he starts tables. flipping tables. Yep. Because that's how he's going to restore the sons of Levi. Right? He's going to restore them, not by you know, helping them give better sacrifices. He's going to restore them by causing them to repent. And then the final promise of the book of Malachi is this. He says, Behold, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will make things new. Right? And so, the way that Malachi ends, and the way the Old Testament ends, the final word from God until God went radio silent for 400 years is that he says, Watch out for Elijah. Whenever this Elijah like figure shows up, that's when you know I'm about to do something new. And the Messiah might be right behind him. And so the Old Testament ends, and you're waiting for Elijah to show up to prepare the way for the Messiah. And this Elijah figure is going to show up by kicking off this huge revival throughout the land. How does the New Testament open up? With the genealogy of Jesus. But specifically, chronologically speaking in the story, who do we start with? The birth of Jesus? No. Oh. Isn't it John? John? John the Baptist. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, the first chronological event we have in the New Testament is actually the annunciation of the birth of John the Baptist. Oh, right? Because okay. Elijah has to show up before the Lord shows up at his temple. Mm -hmm. uh, and, interestingly enough, we are kind of celebrating all of that this week uh, because today is Palm Sunday where we celebrate Jesus entering into Jerusalem on a donkey. And tomorrow... Uh, it's called Fig Monday uh, because it's the day that Jesus cursed a fig tree. Uh, there's a whole story behind that. But more importantly, um, it is the day when Jesus went in to the temple and started flipping tables. Right? Uh, and then ultimately, um, I'll just remind you, we're not going to be here next Sunday because next Sunday is Easter. Yeah. Right? So um, as much as I would love to spend it with y'all because I view y'all as family, um, go spend it with your actual families, like your blood families. Um, spend it with them. And then, when we come back the week after that, quite fittingly, uh, we actually get to start hopping into the story of Jesus. Um, I don't know if we're going to get into it that week, um, mainly because I actually want to take some time to break down the intertestamental time period. Because for us, we flip from Malachi to Matthew, and it's one page, but 400 years have passed, and the culture of Matthew is not like or the world of Matthew is not the same world as Malachi, right? And so we have to explain what happened in those 400 years. Uh, and so I don't know if we're going to dedicate a whole week to that or if just like half of it or something like that. I don't know. Um, but we will pick up with that 
in two weeks. Sound good? Yep. All right. One of y'all want to pray us out? I'll do it. Go for it. Dear Lord, thank you for this um, time we have spent together to talk about you, and thank you that we were um, all dedicated to uh, this lesson. And please help us to go out and apply this to our lives in any way we can, um, and to not let our trials or anything that might, you know, hinder us um, keep you keep us from serving you. Thank you, Lord, for everything. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.